Hello! We are going to continue with the tale of Despero. We are on chapter 18, Confessions. Rescaro went as Botticelli told him he must to torment the new prisoner and take the red cloth from him. The man was sitting with his legs stretched out straight in front of him, chained on the floor. The red cloth was still draped over his shoulders. Rescaro squeezed through the bars and crept slowly over the damp, weeping stones of the cell floor. When he was close to the man, he said, Ah, welcome, welcome. We are delighted to have you. The man lit a match and looked at Rescaro. Rescaro stared longingly into the light. Go on, said the prisoner. He waved a hand in the direction of Rescaro, and the match went out. You're nothing but a rat. I am, said Rescaro. Exactly that. A rat. Allow me to congratulate you on your very astute powers of observation. What do you want, rat? What do I want? Nothing. Nothing for my sake, that is. I've come for you. I've come to keep you company here in the dark. He crawled closer to the man. I don't need the company of a rat. What about the solace of a sym sympathetic ear can provide? Do you need that? Huh? Would you like to confess your sins? To a rat? You're kidding, you are. Come now, said Rescaro. Close your eyes. Pretend that I am not a rat. Pretend that I am nothing but a voice in the darkness. A voice that cares. The prisoner closed his eyes. All right, he said. I'll tell you. But I'm not telling you because there ain't no point in not telling you. No point in keeping secrets from a dirty little rat. I ain't in such a desperate way that I need to lie to a rat. The man cleared his throat. I'm here for stealing six cows, two jerseys, and four guernseys. Cow theft. That's my crime. He opened his eyes and stared into the darkness. He laughed. He closed his eyes again. But there's something else I've done. Many years ago, another crime, and they didn't even know of it. Go on, said Rescaro softly. He crept closer. He allowed one paw to touch the magical red cloth. I traded my girl, my own daughter, for this red tablecloth and for a hen and for a handful of cigarettes. Tsk, said Rescaro. He was not alarmed to hear of such a hideous thing. His parents, after all, had not much cared for him, and certainly, if there was any profit in it, they would have sold him. And then, too, Botticelli Remorso, one lazy Sunday afternoon, had recited from memory all the confessions he had heard from prisoners. What humans were capable of <clears throat> came as no surprise to Rescaro. And then, said the man, and then, encouraged Rescaro, and then I'd done the worst thing of all. I walked away from her, and she was crying and calling out for me, and I did not even look back. I did not. Oh, Lord. I kept walking. The prisoner cleared his throat. He sniffled. Ah, said Rescaro. Yes, I see. By now he was standing so that all four paws were touching the red cloth. Do you find comfort in this cloth you, that you sold your child for? It's warm, said the man. Was it worth your child? I like the color of it. Does the cloth remind you of what you have done wrong? It does, the prisoner said. He sniffed. It does. Allow me to ease your bur burden, said Rescaro. He stood on his hind legs and bowed at the waist. I will take this reminder of your sin from you, he said. The rat took off the red tablecloth in his strong teeth and pulled it off his the shoulders of the man. Hey, see here? I want that back. But Rescaro, reader, was quick. He pulled the tablecloth through the bars of the cell, whoosh, like a magic trick in reverse. Hey, shouted the prisoner, bring that back. It's all I got. Yes, said Roscaro, and that is exactly why I must have it. You dirty rat, shouted the prisoner. Yes, said Roscaro, that is right. That is most accurate. And he left the man and dragged the tablecloth back to his nest and considered it. What a disappointment it, it was. Looking out at Roscaro, knew that Botticelli was wrong. What Roscaro wanted, what he needed, was not the cloth, but the light that had shone behind it. He wanted to be filled, flooded, blinded again with light. And for that, reader, the rat knew he must go upstairs. Chapter 19. Light, light everywhere. Imagine, if you will, having spent the whole of your life in a dungeon. Imagine that late one spring day, you step out of the dark into a world of bright windows and polished floors, winking copper pots, shining suits of armor, and tapestries sewn in gold. Imagine. And while you're imagining things, imagine this too. 
Imagine that the same time the rat steps from the dungeon and into the castle, a mouse is being born upstairs. A mouse reader who is destined, destined to meet the light bedazzled rat. But that meeting will occur much later. And for now, the rat is nothing but happy, delighted, amazed to find himself standing in so much light. I, said Roscaro, spinning dizzily from one bright thing to the next, will, I will never leave. No, never. I will never go back to the dungeon. Why would I? I will never torture another prisoner. It is here that I belong. The rat wa waltzed happily from room to room until he found himself at the door of the banquet hall. He looked inside and saw gathered there was King Philip, Queen Rosemary, the Princess P, twenty noble people, a juggler, four minstrels, and all the king's men. This party reader was a sight for a rat's eyes. Roscaro had never seen happy people. He had known only the Miss Rollins. Gregory the jailer and those who were consigned to his domain did not laugh or smile or clink glasses with the person sitting next to them. Roscaro was enchanted. Everything glittered. Everything. The gold spoons on the table and the jingle bells on the juggler's cap, the strings on the minstrel's guitars, and the crowns on the king's and queen's heads. And the little princess, how lovely she was. How much like the light itself. Her gown was covered in sequins that winked and glimmered at the rat. And when she laughed, she, she laughed often, everything around her seemed to glow brighter. Oh, really, said Roscaro. This is too extraordinary. This is too wonderful. I must tell Botticelli that he, he was wrong. Suffering is not the answer. Light is the answer. And he made his way into the banquet hall. He lifted his tail off the ground and held it at an angle and marched in time to the music the minstrels were playing on their guitars. The rat reader invited himself to the party. Chapter 20. A View from a Chandelier There was, in the banquet hall, a most beautiful and ornate chandelier. The crystals that hung from it caught the light of the candles on the table and the light from the face of the laughing princess. They danced to the rhythm of the minstrel's music swaying back and forth, twinkling and beckoning. What better place to view all this glory, all this beauty? There was so much laughing and singing and juggling that no one noticed as Roscoe crawled up the table leg and onto the table and from there flung himself onto the lowest branch of the chandelier. Hanging by one paw, he swung back and forth, admiring the spectacle below him. The smells of the food, the sound of the music, and the light, the light, the light. Amazing. Unbelievable. Roscoe smiled and shook his head. Unfortunately, a rat can hang from a chandelier for only so long before he is discovered. This would be true at even the loudest party. Reader, do you know who it was that spotted him? You're right. The sharp-eyed Princess P. A rat, she shouted. A rat is hanging from the chandelier. The party, as I have noted, was loud. The minstrels were strumming and singing. The people were laughing and eating. The man with the jingle cap was juggling and jingling. No one, in the midst of all this merriment, heard the peep. No one except for Roscaro. Rat. He had never before been aware of what ugly word it was. Rat. In the middle of all that beauty, it immediately became clear that it was an extremely distasteful syllable. Rat. A curse. An insult. A word totally without light. And not until he heard it from the mouth of Princess did he did Roscaro realize that he did not like being a rat, that he did not want to be a rat. This revelation hit Roscaro with such force that it made him lose his grip on the chandelier. The rat reader fell. And alas, he fell right directly into the queen's bowl of soup. And then this picture says, A rat, she shouted, a rat is hanging from the chandelier. Chapter 21, The Queen's Last Words The Queen loved soup. She loved soup more than anything in the world except for the Princess P and the King. And because the Queen loved it, soup was served in the castle for every banquet, every lunch, and every dinner. And what soup it was. Cook's love and admiration for the Queen and her palate moved, th moved the broth that she concocted from the level of mere food to a high art. On this particular day, for this particular banquet, Cook had outdone himself. The soup was a masterwork, 
a delicate mingling, <clears throat> a delicate mingling of chicken, watercress, and garlic. Brascaro, as he surfeit, surfaced from the bottom of the queen's bowl, could not help taking a few appreciative sips. Lovely, he said, distracted for a moment from the mis misery of his existence. Delightful. See, shouted the pea. See, she stood. She pointed her finger right at Rascaro. It is a rat. I told you that he, it was a rat. He was hanging from the chandelier, and now he's in Mama's soup. The musician, musicians stopped playing their guitars. The jugglers stopped juggling. The noble people stopped eating. The queen looked at Rascaro. Rascaro looked at the queen. Reader, in the spirit of honesty, I must utter a difficult and unsavory truth. Rats are not beautiful creatures. They are not even cute. They are really rather nasty beasts, particularly if one happens to appear in your bowl of soup with pieces of watercress clinging to his whiskers. There was a long moment of silence, and then Roscaro said to the queen, I beg your pardon? In response, the queen flung her spoon in the air and made an incredible noise, a noise that was in no way worthy of a queen, a noise somewhere between the neigh of a horse and the squeal of a pig. A noise that sounded something like this. And then she said, There's a rat in my soup. The queen was really a simple soul and always, her whole life, had done nothing except state the overly obvious. She died as she lived. There's a rat in my soup, were the last words she uttered. She clenched her chest and fell over backward. And her royal, her royal chair hit the floor with a thump. And the banquet hall exploded. Spoons were dropped chairs were flung back save her thundered the king you must save her all the king's men ran to try and rescue the queen Roscaro climbed out of the bowl of soup he felt that under the circumstances it would be best if he left as he crawled across the tablecloth he remembered the words of the prisoner in the dungeon his regret that he did not look back at his daughter as he left her and so Roscaro turned he looked back and he saw the princess was glaring at him her eyes filled with disgust and anger Go back to the dungeon, was what the look she gave him said. Go back to the darkness where you belong. This look, reader, broke Roscaro's heart. Did you think that rats did not have hearts? Wrong. All living things have a heart, and the heart of any living thing can be broken. If the rat had not looked over his shoulder, perhaps his heart would not have broken. And if pos it is possible then that I would not have a story to tell. But reader, he did look. Chapter 22. He puts his heart together again. Roscaro hurried from the banquet hall. A rat, he said. He put a paw over his heart. I am a rat, and there is no light for rats. There will be no light for me. The king's men were still bent over the queen. The king was still shouting, save her, save her. And the queen was still dead, of course, when Roscaro encountered the queen's royal soup spoon lying on the floor. I will have something beautiful, he said aloud. I am a rat, but I will have something beautiful. I will have a crown of my own. He picked up the spoon and put it on his head. And then this picture is captioned. I will have something beautiful and I will have revenge. Yes, said Roscaro, I will have something beautiful, and I will have revenge. Both things, somehow. There are those, heart, those hearts, reader, that never mend again once they are broken. Or if they do mend, they heal themselves in a crooked and lopsided way, as if sewn together by a careless craftsman. Such was the fate of Charoscuro. His heart was broken. Picking up the spoon and placing it on his head, speaking of revenge, these things helped him to put his heart together again but it was the last put together wrong where is the rat shouted the king find that rat if you want me muttered Roscaro as he left the banquet hall i will be in the dungeon in the darkness chapter 23 consequences there were of course dire consequences of Roscaro's behavior every action reader no matter how small has a consequence for instance the young Roscaro gnawed on gregory the jailer's rope, and because he gnawed on the rope, a match was lit in his face, and because a match was lit in his face, his soul was set afire. The rat's soul was set afire, and because of this, he journeyed upstairs seeking the light. 
Upstairs in the banquet hall, the Princess P spotted him and called out the word rat. And because of this, Roscuro fell into the queen's soup. And because the rat fell into the queen's soup, the queen died. You can see, can't you, how everything is related to everything else? You can see quite clearly how every action has a consequence. For instance, if reader, you will indulge me and allow me to continue this mediation on consequences. Because the queen died while eating soup, the heartbroken king outlawed soup. And because soup was outlawed, so were all the instruments involved in making in the eating of soup. Spoons and bowls and kettles. These were collected from all people of the kingdom of Dor, and they were piled in the dungeon. And because Roscuro was dazzled by the light of one match, and journeyed upstairs and fell into the queen's soup, and the queen died, the king ordered the death of every rat in the land. The king's men went bravely into the dungeon to kill the rats. But the thing about killing a rat is that you must first find a rat. And if a rat does not want to be found, reader, he will not be found. The king's men succeeded only in getting lost in the dungeon's torturous mazes. Some of them, in fact, did not ever find their way out again and died there in the dark heart of the castle. And so, the killing of all rats was not successful. And in desperation, King Philip declared that rats were illegal. He declared them outlaws. This, of course, was a ridiculous law, as rats are outlaws to begin with. How can you outlaw an outlaw? It is a waste of time and energy. But still, the king officially decreed that all rats in the kingdom of Dor were outlaws and should be treated as such. When you are a king, you may make <clears throat> as many ridiculous laws as you like. That is what being a king is all about. For reader, we must not forget that King Philip loved the queen and that without her, he was lost. This is the danger of loving. No matter how powerful you are, no matter how many kingdoms you rule, you cannot stop for those you love from dying. Making soup illegal, outlawing rats, these things soothe the poor king's heart, and so we must forgive him. And what of the outlawed rats? What of one outlaw rat in particular? What of Roscaro? In the darkness of the dungeon, he sat in his nest with a spoon atop his head. He set to work fashioning for himself a kingly cape made out of our scrap of the red tablecloth. And as he worked, one old-eared Botticelli Remorso sat next to him, swinging his locket back and forth, back and forth, saying, You see what comes from a rat going upstairs? I hope that you have learned your lesson. Your job in this world is to make others suffer. Yes, muttered Roscaro. Yes, that is exactly what I intend to do. I will make the princess suffer for how she looked at me. And as Roscaro worked and planned, the jailer Gregory held tight to his rope and made his own way through the darkness. And in a dank cell, the prisoner, who had once had a red tablecloth and now had nothing, spent his days and nights weeping quietly. High above the dungeon, upstairs in the castle, a small mouse stood alone one evening as his brothers and sisters sniffed for crumbs. He stood with his head cocked to one side, listening to a sweet sound he did not yet have a name for. There would be consequences of the mouse's love for music. You, reader, already know some of those consequences. Because of the music, the mouse would find his way to a princess. He would fall in love. And speaking of consequences, the same evening Despero stood inside the castle, hearing music for the first time. Outside of the castle, in the gloom of dusk, more consequences drew near. A wagon driven by the king's soldier and piled high with spoons and bowls and kettles was making its way to the castle. And besides the soldier, there sat a young girl with ears that looked like nothing so much as pieces of cauliflower stuck to either side of her head. The girl's name, reader, was Miggery Sal, and though she did not yet know it, she would be instrumental in helping the rat work his revenge. And that is the end of the second book, and the, we're going to start the third book. It says, Gore, the Tale of Miggery Sal. Chapter 24, A Handful of Cigarettes, a Red Tablecloth, and a Hen. Again, reader, we must go backward before we can go forward. With that said, here begins a short story, a short history of the life and times of Miggery Sal, a girl born into this world many years before the mouse Despero and the rat Roscuro, a girl born far from the castle, a girl named for her, her father's favorite prize-winning pig. Miggery Sal was six years old when her mother, holding onto Mig's hand and staring directly into Mig's eyes, died. 
Ma, said Meg. Ma, couldn't you stay here with me? Oh, said her mother. Who is that? Who is that holding my hand? It's me, Ma, Miggery Sal. Ah, uh, child, let me go. But I want you to stay here, said Meg, wiping first at her runny nose and then at her runny eyes. You want, said her mother. Yes, said Meg, I want. Ah, uh, child, and what doesn't matter what you are wanting, said her mother. She squeezed Meg's hands once, twice. And then she died, leaving Meg all alone with her father, who, on a market day in the spring soon after his wife's death, sold his daughter into service for a handful of cigarettes, a red tablecloth, and a hen. Papa, said Meg, when her father was walking away from her with the hen in his arms, a cigarette in his mouth, and the red tablecloth draped across his shoulders like a cape. Go on, Meg, he said. You belong to that man now. But I don't want to, Papa, she said. I want to go with you. She took hold of the red tablecloth and tugged on it. Lord, child, her father said, and who is asking you what you want? Go on now. He untangled her fingers from the tablecloth and turned into the direction of the man who had bought her. Meg watched her father walk away, the red tablecloth billowing out behind him. He left his daughter, and reader, as you already know, he did not look back, not even once. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine your father selling you for a tablecloth? a hen, and a handful of cigarettes. Close your eyes, please, and consider it for just a moment. Done? I hope that the hair on the back of your neck stood up as you thought of Meg's fate and how it would be if it was were your own. Poor Meg, what will become of her? You must, frightened though you may be, read on and see for yourself. Reader, it is your duty. Chapter 25, A Vicious Circle. Megary Sal called the man who purchased her uncle, as she said she must. And also, as he said she must, Meg tended uncle's sheep and cooked uncle's food and scrubbed uncle's kettle. She did all of this without a word of thanks or praise from the man himself. Another unfortunate fact of life with uncle was that he is very much like giving Meg what he referred to as a good clout to the ear. In fairness to Uncle, it must be reported that he did always inquire whether or not Meg was interested in receiving the clout. Their daily exchanges went something like this. Uncle, I thought I told you to clean the kennel. Meg, I cleaned it, Uncle. I cleaned it good. Uncle, ah, it's filthy. You have to be punished, won't you? Meg, gore, Uncle. I cleaned the kettle. Uncle, are you saying I'm a liar, girl? Meg, no, Uncle. Do you want a good clout to the ear, then? No, thank you, Uncle. I don't. Alas, Uncle seemed to be as entirely unconcerned with what Meg wanted as her mother and father had been. The disgust clout to the ear was always delivered. Delivered, I am afraid, with a great deal of enthusiasm on Uncle's part and received with absolutely no enthusiasm at all on the part of Meg. These clouts were alarmingly frequent, and Uncle was scrumptious, scrumptious, Fair in paying attention to both the right and the left side of Miggy Cell, Miggery Cell. So it was <clears throat> that after a time, the young Meg's ears came to resemble not so much ears as pieces of cauliflower stuck to either side of her head, and they became about as useful as to her as pieces of cauliflower. That is to say, that they all but ceased their functioning as ears. Words for Mig lost their sharp edges, and then they lost their edges altogether and became blurry, blankety things that she had a great deal of trouble making any sense out of all. The less Mig heard, the less she understood. The less she understood, the more things she did wrong, and the more things she did wrong, the more clouds to the ear she received, and the less she heard. This is what is known as a vicious cycle, and Miggery Sal was right in the center of it which is not, reader, where anybody would want to be. But then, as you know, what Miggery Sal wanted had never been <clears throat> had never been of much concern to anyone. Okay, so we are going to stop there today. And if you have any questions, please email me or Ms. Hoppert and be on the lookout for our Zoom chat on Friday.